It's that time of year again. Families are dropping their kids off at college, moving them into their dorms. Today, I want to talk about student housing. This has been on my list for a couple years now, but moving has also been on my mind because we just recently moved across the country again, which is always an expensive nightmare. So I've had tenants rights and landlords and all of that on the brain. Also with lots of conversations about student loans swirling around. I feel like we often talk about the prices of college tuition, but not as much about the role that room and board plays in the student debt crisis. So really today, I just want to vent about student housing for a bit. Why is it often so bad and so expensive? By the way, this is my dog Clark. I think he's staring at squirrels out there. Let's get into dorm culture. Even though many students do live at home or commute, living in the dorms is basically a rite of passage, especially in the US. It is a huge part of the quintessential college experience. Many colleges here require students to live on campus for at least their first year or two. They say it helps students adjust to living in a new place, gain some independence without being totally on their own. It fosters community and is apparently better for academics. You're walking distance from classes right around the corner from friends. You study, work, eat, and sleep all in the same place. Our colleges, company towns, they do sometimes have their own currency. But really, there definitely are benefits to living on campus, and I miss some parts of it for sure. For many of us, it's the first or even only time that we live in a walkable, bike-friendly place with tons of other young people around. From Jim Wunsch, the campus is in certain respects like a city neighborhood. If Jane Jacobs strolled about the quad, she might point approvingly to high-density dorms set amid old and new buildings, and to students walking from one activity to another without need of a car. Having been raised in suburbs, students arriving on campus may experience, perhaps for the first time, the pleasure and annoyance of living in a crowded place. In any event, going away to school is often considered an essential aspect of the college experience. But before we continue, this portion of today's video is sponsored by ThreadUp. ThreadUp is the world's largest online consignment and thrift store, and August is secondhand month on ThreadUp, so we are going to celebrate. According to this study, almost 60% of all clothing produced is disposed of within a year of production. That is tragic. So let's shop secondhand when we can and give great pieces a new life. I'm gonna show you what I got this time, and if you like anything I picked, you can see all of those items and shop similar things on ThreadUp. First up, we have these black overalls from Levi's. Estimated retail price is $102. I got them on ThreadUp for $47.99. I'm so excited about these. I have been looking for overalls for a while. And as soon as I put these on, zipped them up, stretchy, comfy. By the way, ThreadUp makes it so easy to search for exactly what you want in your size, in whatever color or brand or style you're looking for. You can shop with their app. It's very easy to browse. Though personally, I prefer desktop because I will end up with 50 tabs open. Anyway, paired with these overalls is this cute little BDG top. I just love this color blue on me. Next up, I have these cream cargo pants from BDG. Estimated retail is $51. I got them for $26.99. They're comfy, of course. They're sporty. They're cool, dare I say. Next up, we have this top from Abercrombie & Fitch. Love the color, love the snaps. You can fully snap it, you can half snap it, you can unsnap it all and wear it as a mini cardigan. Go wild. And if you thought I was done with overalls, you're simply incorrect because I also found this overall dress from BDG. Little camel khaki kind of color. So if you have some shopping to do anytime soon, I highly recommend checking out ThreadUp. Once again, you can shop my picks with my link and use code Tiffany to get an extra 40% off your first order. Living on campus, overpriced and obligatory. So let's discuss what living on campus can be like. For your first year, you're probably going to be in a double room, meaning you have a roommate sleeping just a few feet away. The room has a twin bed, desk, and wardrobe for each person. There are often big communal bathrooms, so everyone has to walk down the hall with their little shower caddies. It's part of the experience. And by that, I mean it's pretty inconvenient and uncomfortable for basically everyone, but I imagine is even harder for NBs, gender non-conforming students or anyone with a disability. There can be accommodations made, but those are not always sufficient. Another potential housing arrangement would be a suite, which is what I had my freshman year. So my room and the room next door shared a bathroom between the four of us. Overall, my dorm was solid. I enjoyed it. We had the classic cinder block walls, but we made it pretty cozy. Real quick, I want to talk about the whole roommate thing because this is very typical in the US, but it's not necessarily the norm in every country. 
right? So I'm wondering who decided that pairing two 18 year old kids together and making them live in the same room would be ideal. I assume it comes down to space, money. We know, we know. But like other countries are able to make this work in a, a different configuration. People love to say, oh, living in the dorms is good for you. The kids are going to learn interpersonal skills and conflict resolution. Will they? let's hope so because otherwise it's a nightmare. I was really lucky. I had great roommates in college, but I also always shared a room growing up. So this wasn't brand new to me, but I still feel like we don't have to share a room with a stranger in order to practice or learn these skills. Like sharing an apartment, sharing a kitchen, <laughs> that's, that's the struggle. Learning how to coexist and be respectful in shared spaces is very important, but I think we kind of just throw kids in the deep end. I feel like this alone, like this space and the lack of privacy and just like so many people around, depending on your temperament, your personality, your noise tolerance, your sleep schedule, dorms can be really fun or they can be kind of horrendous. Overall though, I really don't think dorms are that bad. I think living in a simple room is fine. Having a roommate can be fine. My problem, my biggest beef with this whole system is first of all, that it's required and that it is so expensive for what you're getting. You don't have any other option. I don't think that's fair and I don't think that's setting up students and families to be able to make the decisions that actually work for them in order to get this degree. Now, with that in mind, let's go over some prices. What was I paying? I'm using Loyola New Orleans as an example. That's where I went for my first three semesters of undergrad. A double room costs $42.50 per semester, which shakes out to about $9.50 a month. I think I'm overcomplicating the math here, but when I wrote this, I was considering a full academic year to be like nine months. So each semester is four and a half months, but a semester is technically more like 15 weeks, and then you have to leave for break. So really it's closer to 1,133 per month that you're actually on campus, but who cares? That is the price per semester. That's all you have to know. But that's just for your room. Most colleges require dorm students to also have a meal plan. Depending on how many meals per week you choose, the cost can range from $28.85 to $36.25 per semester. So let's imagine you're trying to get the lowest possible scenario on campus at Loyola New Orleans for a triple room and the lowest meal plan allowed, that would be about $13,000 for freshman year. You know how older people like to say they worked their way through college? Looking at Louisiana, Louisiana, if you were working 40 hours a week, earning minimum wage, $7.25 an hour, your take-home pay would only be $932 a month. So even if you could handle working full-time and being a full-time student, which some people do, but it is extremely difficult, you could not cover even just your room and board out of pocket, let alone all of your other living expenses. And the more standard freshman situation costs even more. A double room with a mid-tier meal plan comes out to more like $15,000 for the academic year, about $16.66 a month. So that is aside from tuition, which is another beast, and assuming that you can live at home for free every summer, which is not the case for everyone, in four years, just for your room and board to get through college, that would cost you $60,000, at this school at least. Now, I know that everyone knows this is expensive. That's not the like shocking part of this video, and that's really not my intention. I'm not sharing anything that's probably groundbreaking. I just want to vent because I think the system is so bad. It's, I can't help but talk about it. I remember when I applied to colleges and you're very focused on the cost of tuition and you're trying to do your FAFSA, figure out financial aid. It's all very confusing. Then you get your acceptance letter and they give you your financial aid package only after you've been accepted and suddenly you're excited, but then you're looking at those numbers and you're like, how am I gonna make this work? For my situation, all of my tuition was covered by scholarships and grants, which was fantastic. But then again, room and board, I'm looking at that and I'm like, oh, I didn't realize it was gonna cost this much. And colleges want you to sign up for housing like immediately. They say, send your deposit, sign up online. Otherwise you could risk not having a space in the dorms. So all of a sudden I had to sign up for these loans. Cause I was like, well, I wanna go to the school and the only way that's gonna happen is if I sign on the dotted line, okay. People always talk about how like, oh, 18 year olds sign up for student loans and they have no idea what they're doing. Which, sure, I think a lot of a lot of students and even families, parents, can't really genuinely grasp what those future loans are gonna be or what the payoff is gonna be like. 
But part of the problem is really lack of transparency and then feeling rushed to make these huge decisions and being told, you know, you look at a a loan payoff calculator and they say, yeah, you'll easily pay this off. You'll pay X number a month for a couple of years, 10 years maybe, and then boom, you're good. But it could turn out that you go to college and it ends up costing you way more than those calculators expected. I've seen so many stories, you know, talking about student debt forgiveness and hoping that this will come through and help people. And of course, conservatives and anyone against forgiveness, they all just say, just pay your loans. I did it. The thing is, so many people have paid their loans multiple times over and their balance is still not gone. Sometimes their balance is even higher than when they started because of predatory interest rates and these payment plans that are supposed to help you in the short term, but end up screwing you over long term. All right, I'm going to talk about this student loan bullshit. The example being my beautiful wife, who in 2005 graduated college with $22,000 in student loans. It has been 216 months since we started paying on this loan. Our average monthly payment was around $300. That gives you $64,800 that we have paid towards a $22,000 loan. We still owe $18,576.92. And we are not an anomaly. This is the reality for millions of Americans. So when we say we need to cancel all student loan debt and make colleges and universities free to attend, this is why. According to this article, the price of room and board is rising even faster than tuition at rates above inflation. So why are these costs going up so much, especially when a lot of these dorms aren't very nice? First of all, raising tuition is very unpopular. So often colleges realize that they can kind of hide those increased costs by raising room and board fees instead. They justify this by saying, you know, they need it for maintenance or they're improving the properties or they blame the students. Oh, they're demanding gourmet food and luxury housing. Some of these dorms are too much. Like they've got like movie theaters, spa, pool, arcades. It might be true that some students, wealthier students, are demanding luxury housing, but most students I think are just trying to survive so they can go to class. And you're forcing them to live on campus for a very high fixed cost. From this Jill Barche article, Richard Vetter said, I hate to use ripping students off, but they're using their monopoly position to disguise the true cost of the price of college. I think it's safe to say many colleges are ripping students off. Anyway, I want to compare that to when I studied abroad in France. Yes, I had to mention it because I love my French dorm. My sophomore year of college, spring semester, I studied abroad in Aix-en-Provence, France. Mwah, love you, miss you. I lived in a cruise dorm in the Cité U de Cuc. Shouts out. But really, I loved this little room. It's tiny, but it's so efficient. You've got your bed, you've got plenty of storage. Like, I feel like it's already built better than a standard American dorm. And then you get your tiny little bathroom, which is kind of like an airplane toilet, but you make it work. Toilet, sink, little shower. Of course, they have other bigger, more accessible options if you need it. But for me, this was honestly the perfect situation. I was so happy I didn't have a roommate. I had all my space to myself. I decorated from Campus France. Cruz residences are public and subsidized by the French government. It's the most popular accommodation for students. Rent is low, 400 euros in Paris, 200 euros in other regions, with the possibility to benefit from rental assistance from the French CAF. Here's the thing that hurts in in hindsight, though. I did not pay that price, and I also didn't pay my direct French tuition. I did an exchange program with my university, so I paid full price of like a semester on campus, a semester of room and board. So I was covering for whatever exchange student was coming from France, and then I was going there. But if I had known that I could have enrolled directly and paid so much less, I was leaving that college anyway, so it didn't really matter, whatever. Too late. (laughs) But seriously, I had privacy in this room, more freedom, like guests over without anybody knocking on your door. All my needs were met, all for the low price of like 200 something euros. I mean, socialized housing and education. Imagine that, imagine that. My US brain can barely comprehend it. I would love to hear from French viewers about this because I'm sure that these systems are not perfect, but this is at least an example of something that I think would certainly be an improvement over the system that the US has. Back to my point about room and board's role in student debt. All of the loans that I took out 
were basically to go to housing. I, I continued to take out loans for a future semester to be able to pay for off-campus rent until I transferred schools and then I was able to become a full-time YouTuber and I could actually pay my rent myself. I don't know if it really changes anything. Like, does it really matter if your student loan balance technically came from paying for tuition or paying for living expenses? Because of course, both are required in order to go to college. It's not really possible to get through four years of school without housing and food, you know? You might be thinking, okay, well, what? <laughs> what solutions do you have? In my ideal version of this, public college would be tuition free and housing would be free for students, or at the very, very least, heavily subsidized, and loans would be at 0% interest. I know that sounds pie in the sky to some of you, but it's like, are we really trying to help students here? Do we want people to be able to have a better future? Because obviously that's not, that dream is not coming true. And for many people going to college, trying to get a degree, trying to pay for housing, getting in all this debt, ends up being like the worst mistake of their lives. And that's not okay. That's not right. I think we as a society in the United States can and should be doing so much better. Anyway, let's continue. What about off-campus housing? So most people after the year or two that they're required to live in dorms decide I'm gonna move off campus. I'm gonna try to find some cheaper rent. But again, these schools and these college towns are so crowded, housing competition is huge. People often sign their leases six months or a year before the next school year begins. It is intense. Obviously we all know there's a housing crisis overall, but student housing has its own unique challenges from the Boston Globe. Local schools did add some new dorms over the last decade, but only enough units to accommodate less than half of the tens of thousands of added students they've accepted during that time. The shortfall reflects a national trend. In state after state, surging college enrollments have outpaced construction of dorms, according to federal data, pushing students off campus. Students need somewhere to live, but local residents are getting pushed out. And of course, housing insecurity is a big barrier to students being able to finish their degree. Many students end up homeless, living in cars or sleeping on couches, or they're forced to drop out of school entirely because they can't afford to live close enough to be able to go to school. Then you end up with the debt and no degree to show for it, which is the worst possible scenario. Oh, we need more housing for students and the colleges aren't coming through, here comes luxury student housing. Luxury might be a generous term for some of these complexes, but they sure are expensive. These communities are similar to the dorm lifestyle, but they're privately owned and not officially affiliated with the university, typically. But you basically only sign a lease for your bed or your room, so you're not responsible for the whole apartment. And you can use financial aid as proof of income, which does help a lot of students because many of them would not qualify on their own or they would need a guarantor, which they don't always have. And again, these apartments are often labeled luxury. They talk about all these fancy amenities they have. They have beautiful, colorful pictures. But often, you guessed it, they are overpriced and under-maintained. These developments are pretty interesting. They're similar to like the gentrification buildings that we see popping up everywhere. They're probably all owned by like the same mega investors. But these developers are coming in and they are dominating college neighborhoods, which is really harming the local areas. Yes, they're providing much needed housing, but they're displacing local residents and they're emphasizing the gap between the richer and the poorer students. There definitely are wealthier students who do want this kind of housing. They want the penthouse to themselves. But I think most students don't want luxury. They just want a decent place to live at hopefully affordable rents. But there seems to be nothing in the middle. You have luxury expensive apartments on one end and then you've got really shitty questionable housing on the other. And those are still often not very affordable anyway. Again, this echoes the general problems in the housing crisis right now. There seems to be a missing middle. So many of us want that like mid-tier, affordable, decent, not too fancy housing. But it either doesn't exist or there's not enough of those type of units to meet the demand. But you might be thinking, you know what? College students don't need fancy places. And if they live in a shithole, that's fine. It's part of the experience. Kids are supposed to be broke in college. You're supposed to struggle. That's such a popular narrative that I feel like even people who aren't conservative accept this kind of bootstrappy narrative. We glorify the struggle. We say that it's good for you. It's good for students to live like this. Be broke, live off ramen, get no sleep, work hard, and you can prove that you're a 
productive member of society. Though, of course, this doesn't apply to the wealthier students who are going to have great housing, no worries about bills. They don't have to work a job so they can focus on socializing or Greek life, whatever. Unpaid internships. Anyway, I strongly disagree with this idea that students or young people in general have to suffer, they have to struggle, or they deserve to in order to learn or grow. Yes, working hard and perseverance, those are good traits to an extent. No hustle culture here. But struggling, like true struggling, I think is bad for us. That's suffering. Why are we putting young people through suffering under the guise of like self-improvement? It doesn't make sense to me. Anyway, on that note, part of this expected college experience is to live in a shitty college apartment. Again, you go from the dorms and then you go to your shitty apartment. It's a rite of passage. Do you have 10 roommates? Is there always a mountain of dirty dishes in the sink that no one will ever clean for an entire semester? Yeah, these apartments have a reputation for being disgusting, but that's how it's meant to be, you know? Because young people are messy. And then these places aren't really maintained because the college kids are gonna trash them anyway. Might as well keep them shitty, right? This definitely allows terrible landlords to take advantage of this. They can have horrible housing and they know because of the demand, they're gonna get some students to move in no matter how bad it is. And this creates like a feedback loop of low expectations. Shitty places get shittier. And I think students try to kind of cope with it again, being like, oh, haha, it's part of the experience. What can you do? But dare I say, they deserve better. Crazy concept. I think college would be a great time to teach young people about tenants' rights. What are you entitled to? What is your landlord required to help with? Living in shitty college housing should not be considered a rite of passage. It's dangerous and unacceptable. I read this series from the Boston Globe from 2014 about the tragic death of a student named Binland Lee. It was a quirky old place, but it was home to Binlin Lee and her 13 housemates. It was also blatantly illegal from basement bedrooms without permits to the unit with only one way out, where Binlin happily lived and where she died when fire struck last spring. Boston, defined in large measure by the students who flock to it, allows these eager newcomers to be put at risk in overcrowded houses that serve as shoddy substitutes for modern dorms. Such illegal overcrowding is rampant in student neighborhoods, a health and safety hazard virtually ignored by city inspectors and exacerbated by local universities that have in recent years admitted more students than they can house. On that same street, there was another devastating fire the year before where another student had to jump out of a window, had a brain injury, went into a coma. These pieces were incredibly hard to read. It is just horrifying that students are so often put in these positions that students have and will die. A collision of greed, neglect, and mismanagement is endangering young people in America's college capital while enriching some absentee investors, landlords who maximize profits by packing students into properties. A Globe analysis of records found that four student-rich zip codes, when adjusted for population, have 50% more complaints overall than the citywide average in more than a dozen categories, including mold and mice infestation, as well as more serious safety concerns such as missing or broken carbon monoxide detectors and overcrowding. And again, these housing markets are horrible for students. It's extremely competitive and expensive. It's also terrible for other residents. Today in the triple deckers, duplexes, and red brick apartment complexes that surround the city's biggest universities, a kind of real estate black market has blossomed. illegal overcrowding has in some cases created a maddening paradox. While individual properties have deteriorated, overall housing prices have skyrocketed, making it difficult, if not impossible, for middle-class families to buy houses or afford rents. Final thoughts. Obviously, the situation is bleak. Again, I suggested my optimistic solutions. I know that it's unlikely for any of those things to happen soon in the United States, but I will continue dreaming because again, we deserve better and I will not stop saying that. I am so frustrated by people giving up or people believing that we can't do better or worse, believing that people deserve to live in bad situations because they're young, because they're poor, because they're students, because they're old, because they're disabled. No one deserves to live in uncomfortable, unsafe conditions. And I think the the lowest standard of what we consider acceptable needs to be raised. And after thinking about this for the past few weeks, I'm coming to like the most classic takeaway of all. I know it applies to like everything under capitalism, but I'm just like, if we want to help people in our society, society be better, to learn and grow, wouldn't it make sense to support them? I don't know. 
Wild idea. Let's dismantle this narrative about the struggle being noble and that it makes us better, it makes us stronger. No, it hurts people. Anyway, now this just has me thinking about all sorts of social safety nets and other socialized systems that I wish we had because people deserve it. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed this video. Again, I just kind of wanted to rant because I've been thinking about this and dealing with my own housing and reading leases. And I'm very fortunate to be in a totally fine situation. But um, yeah, it's just kind of maddening that so many people have to go through such difficult and expensive processes just to be able to live. And I just wanted to vent. I hope that you're all doing well. And thank you again to ThreadUp. You can use my link to shop my picks and you can get an extra 40% off your first order with code Tiffany. And I wanna give a shout out to my lovely patrons. If you wanna check out my Patreon, I make bonus behind the scenes kind of content there. And extra thank yous to my executive producer tier. We have Abby Hayden, Chloe Noel, Dalek Mems, Freshly Laundered, Ivy Adam, Jackie King, Jeanette B, Jill Hoffman, Julie Leva, Matthew Gray, Megan Collins, MegCat33, Morgan Tisa, Nicole Louise, Sarah Kemi, Stevie May, and Treffa. Thank you all for being patrons. And stay tuned for future internet analysis videos. Let me know if you have any topics you would like me to dive into. And should we say bye, Clark? Are you done looking out the window? He's a good boy. That is all. See you soon. Okay, thanks. Bye.